Nicole Kreitz with Arizona's family, a proud board member for Military Assistance Mission or MAM. It is an honor to bring you this half hour 9-11 special commercial free thanks to our title sponsor Learner and Row Gives Back. I hope you'll join me in supporting this great cause. Open the camera on your phone, hold it up to the QR code, and we're going to leave that black and white box up at the bottom of your screen. Click the tab that pops up to the secure link donate today. You can also give through our app and azfamily.com. Every dollar stays local supporting Arizona military families. Where were you 20 years ago today? Hard to fathom, we have a whole generation of young adults who don't have that first-hand perspective of the day that changed our world. There was only one victim from Arizona and his family's opening up now for the first time in years to share some perspective on their healing. We'd like to thank all of our family and friends who are here today to share in our happiness. Gary was my number one on this earth. Donna Killaby Bird has had 20 years adjusting to life without her greatest love. On the morning of 9-11, I'm getting ready in the bathroom and I hear that we have breaking news. As I went in and looked at the visual, my heart stopped. We're looking at, uh, at, at probably some, uh, some casualties. Her husband Gary was training for a new job in New York on 9-11. I knew we had a meeting at the World Trade Center. She immediately called his boss. I said, please turn on the TV and tell me if that's your building. I remember waking up, seeing that. Andrew was only 13. For me, it was a shutdown moment. Donna remembers taking the kids to school, relying on routine when reason failed. As time's going on, it's getting worse, not better. Gary was in the second tower, the first to fall. There is smoke in the air over the Pentagon. A third hijacked plane hit the Pentagon, then another went down in a field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Something gave me the ability to just turn it over to a higher power. Soon thereafter, my heart felt peaceful. Through faith, she found strength to share her story. Ran to the phone and called his cell number and said, just call me. But he, he never he never called. I was angry and resentful and um, bitter and distant. Andrew says it took about a decade to snap out of that spiral. My purpose as a mom was to not get lost in the grief. The Tempe healing fields were started to honor Gary. Strangers shared stories of how his life impacted theirs. And my dad was the guy that I was always aspiring to be. He was always present. Camping, hiking, skiing, scuba diving, successful and humble, utterly devoted to his family. His whole life of love and service and kindness and caring, that was Gary. You'll find the story of Arizona's native son at the memorial in Manhattan. Donna and Andrew went for the first time in the fall right before the pandemic. It's intense, it's pretty intense. So much symbolism and perspective, this tile wall, a tapestry of different shades of the same color, one square for each victim. He was just one name among many. His name was the same font as everybody yeah. else on that wall. It's true. And you look up and there's that white subway station thing that looks like bird wings. Bird, bird. Now that Gary's been gone almost as long as he was in her life, sharing his story again now is a reminder for all of us to live each day with honor and no regrets. We frequently would say to each other, wow, we could be dead tomorrow. I don't have regrets. What I ultimately knew is that I was loved by Gary the entire time that he was with us. I had no doubt and he knew that I loved him. There are specific images we can't unsee from that day that imprinted on our heart and soul. One photograph of an impromptu act became a symbol of honor and faith for the fallen and strength and resolve for survivors. This was going to be the story of our generation. It had that kind of magnitude. For photojournalist Tom Franklin, 9-11 was a blur. It struck him when he shot this now iconic photograph, the familiar symbolism to the Battle of Iwo Jima. From the thousands of throats upon ships and on land and sea came the sudden cry, there goes the flag. He had no idea at the time this would become one of the most recognizable images from 
Everything that I saw and I photographed, it was just incomprehensible. No one picture immediately stood out to him any more powerful than the more than 1,000 others he captured that devastating day. Working for the record in New Jersey, Tom was rushing to Lower Manhattan when the second plane hit the towers. We saw a plane coming very low, and everyone said, wow, that plane is very, very low. Oh, my God, another plane has just hit, it hit another building, flew right into the middle of it. Tom shot these images from an impromptu triage center at Exchange Place in Jersey City. Literally right across the Hudson River from Lower Manhattan and the World Trade Center. He recognized the importance of documenting everything to be the eyes for all of us physically distanced from the devastation, to see the grief and pain, to feel the shock and daze, that visceral, raw emotion. It was surreal. I had to really put it in check. You know, I had to compartmentalize the emotions because I was really aware of the historic, you know, aspect of what, what I was photographing. He managed to talk his way onto a boat. As a photojournalist, you're frequently, you know, swimming upstream, and I just wanted to quietly do my job and get as close as I can. Then he was there at ground zero. The dust in the air that had really, you know, sucked all the color out of everything. Everything was gray and there was ash everywhere. Shooting through tears, his lens led him through the rubble. I had never covered war. Uh, I'd never been on a battlefield, but this is this felt like that. I saw lots of search and rescue uh, personnel. I did not see them recover anybody. I did not see any signs of 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 survivors or people who didn't survive. It was just. Ma mangled metal debris and dust. This photo taken of Tom just so happened to be snapped in the same spot he'd returned to hours later to capture the photo that captured our hearts. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw these three firemen and I saw them fumbling with this flag. So I moved closer and I got into a position to make a photograph of this. And it took a couple of minutes for them to finally get this flag attached to a string and they hoisted it up a flagpole. And it, I mean, it was like that. It was very quick. It was not a performance in any shape or fashion. They had no idea I was taking their picture. Eventually used to make a commemorative stamp, Tom's photo helped raise more than $10 million for victims of 9-11. I think there's a lot of positive feelings and emotions that people get from the photograph. Reflecting on the universal significance of the flag flying atop the debris, it all came into focus how this one shot captured the pain and promise that brought us all together. There not, are not too many photographs of that day that people can you know, draw a positive response from. And I think the flag raising photograph is one of those. It'll always be about those thousands of people who died selflessly, in a, in, a, in a horrific way, and uh, we should remember them and we should honor them. The Phoenix Fire Urban Search and Rescue Team trained in New York after the first terrorist attack on the Trade Center in 93, so they were some of the first to ship out to help in 2001. This morning, we're getting our first look at never before seen footage they shot at Ground Zero. For the first time ever, Phoenix Fire is sharing their raw footage from 20 years ago at Ground Zero. Unbelievable. I, I don't even know how to describe it. It's, it's gut wrenching. Men like ants atop mountains of crushed metal showing the true scope of the devastation. And you see it with your eyes, but your mind is having a hard time connecting it. Former Phoenix Fire Chief Bob Kahn met us at the Hall of Flame Museum where they're refurbishing this retired rescue rig from Queens that lost its entire crew of eight on 9-11. I realize that, you know, the chances of finding anybody were slim to none. And still they try. One piece of metal at a time. Digging, searching to find some pocket of hope and they weren't going to give up. That's the other thing. They were out there just working with these five gallon buckets. Um, it was just unbelievable. You basically have an incident in New York City where you have a catastrophic disaster of, of unbelievable proportions. Phoenix Fire sent a team of 72 to Manhattan for two weeks. 
This is what we train for. This is what we do. I went out ahead of the team. Bob got there four days after the attacks. The temporary morgue stayed empty. A lot of them were still in that debris. 2,750 victims, including the bodies of 343 firefighters, buried somewhere in the rubble around them. It was a, a holy place. It was a tomb for the, the, those people. This picture is, that's the skin in the background. Seeing the shell of the structure jutting out of the ground, no offices even partially intact, really hit him. And I realized that slid down on top of families and people and human beings. Each with dozens of family members desperate for answers. It was surreal. I don't know how you couldn't feel that impact. The pain planting a firm appreciation for everything and every moment after that. You just don't take it for granted. I don't want to forget. I want to remember it. As painful as it is for any of us that were there, I don't want to forget how I felt there and how I feel now. The heroism we saw that day inspired all of us to do more, be better, have purpose. And for many, that meant enlisting to serve. This was an actual attack by another country or, or persons within another country, you know, wishing to do us harm. Brian Ishmael was working and going to culinary school when the events of 9-11 changed his life's trajectory. The whole purpose was to try to cause as much harm and, and death as possible. The gravity and reality quickly set in that what happened was no accident. You know, you think about those things. What if I'm taking, you know, my child to the baseball game? Right, and what if that's the next, you know, target? That realization hit home. I just wanted to go do my part. So he signed up to serve in the Army, knowing full well he'd be headed into combat. My mom's father had served, her brother had served, you know, almost everybody in the family had had some sort of service uh, in the military. He was at Air Assault School for the 101st Airborne Division when he got the orders right there, right there. to deploy to Kuwait. <laughs> My artillery gun was the first artillery round fired of the Iraq invasion. After two tours overseas, losing too many brothers and sisters on the battlefield, Brian retired. He's now the Vice President of Military and Veterans Affairs at the University of Phoenix, honored to still be serving. For me, the biggest takeaway I want them to have is, is number one, that the freedoms that we enjoy in the United States are not free. There's people like myself, you know, same age and everything, who went over and did not come back. He says the price they paid shouldn't be squandered on the whims of differences that divide us today. That on this 9-11, we should think back to how that horrific day birthed something beautiful. Remember the big American flags on everybody's car? And you saw American flags up at people's houses and you know, there was just this overwhelming sense of uh, patriotism, and we should be able to disagree on things. But there's definitely a lot more that we agree on and a lot more commonalities that we have that we are not focusing on today. 9-11 wasn't the first time we were ambushed on our own soil. 80 years ago, December 7th, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. Well, I joined the Navy at 18 years old, fresh out of high school. Jack Holder is a humble historian. This is maybe my two radio wins. The World War II naval aviator flew 315 missions, earning three dozen medals and commendations, one of the few remaining Pearl Harbor survivors. I remember it like it was yesterday. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor. We heard a screaming aircraft, and then just moments later, a terrible explosion. The attacking planes number between 50 and 100. December 7th, 1941, Jack was stationed on Ford Island in the harbor when the surprise attack hit right in the middle of roll call. Seeing all the aircraft with the rising sun insignia, we knew immediately what had happened. It so happened that one of my shipmates remembered there was a sewer line behind our hangar under construction. He says, let's go for the ditch, follow me. He'll never forget their close call with a Japanese fighter pilot. I can still see it coming in with the white grinning teeth, the helmet flapping in the breeze, still vivid. 
He emerged from the ditch and saw the devastation on Battleship Row. Arizona just blew up. Seamen jumping off the burning ships into water that was covered with oil and on fire. Arizona, ripped by one of her own exploding magazines, takes a thousand burning men to the bottom. It was the most terrible thing I've ever seen. You're looking at a live picture. 59 years and nine months later. You're watching continuing CBS News coverage. I saw it blow and then ran like hell. What about the casualties? What have you seen? Uncountable. Let's go, let's go. This will go down as a kind of Pearl Harbor of terrorism. Brought back all the memories. September 11, 2001, Jack was working at a driving range when one of his clients came in and told him what was going on. Here it is all over again. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked. Our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. We wonder why it happened, you know, and. Uh, What's the purpose of it and, and all of that? With one military stroke. Jack says both attacks meant to destroy our spirit only galvanized our patriotism. It brought a lot of people together, yeah. He went on to run PBY flight reconnaissance missions, bombing and sinking a Japanese submarine in the Battle of Midway. They come to Midway with four carriers and left with none. After his discharge in 48, Jack didn't really talk about any of that. I didn't think anybody cared. I didn't even tell my golfing buddies I was a World War II veteran, let alone Pearl Harbor. Until he got invited on an honor flight back to Pearl Harbor in 2012. In his 90s, it finally hit him the significance of being a voice of firsthand history. They refer to us as the greatest generation. He wrote a book and now enjoys visiting schools to talk with young students. You folks sitting here can be the next greatest generation. Doing what he can to impart perhaps some wisdom from all he's seen and survived to inspire others to live a life embracing every advantage of our freedoms. You need to stay in school, learn all you can, and remember one thing, you live in the greatest country in the world. So much has changed in just the last month. Seeing the Taliban take control of Afghanistan, a heartbreaking turn of events. Even before that drawdown, we've been witnessing the changing face of the military. For perspective, the recently retired Major General who led our National Guard through the biggest deployment since World War II. I was an F-16 instructor down at Tucson at the 162nd Fire Wing. Retired Major General Mick McGuire had a most unusual assignment on 9-11. I was one of the, just a couple of people that was night vision goggle qualified. Almost immediately I was sent home to go into crew rest. That night and for the next 94 days straight, he flew night missions over the southwestern states, one of only two aircraft airborne for 500 miles in any direction. I don't know if you remember, we shut down all air travel for 72 hours. And as a guy that had been a pilot my whole career, it was such an eerie feeling. It was like the whole world came to a stop. He helped activate the alert readiness facility at davis Monthan Air Force Base. Got live missiles literally moved and we trucked them over to DM and loaded up live ordnance on the, on the aircraft and they're still there today. Live missiles and fighter jets on standby nonstop. They've been on 24 seven, haven't skipped a shift since 9-11, not one day. We spoke right before the withdrawal of American forces from Afghanistan and subsequent fall of the country to the Taliban. If you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. McGuire served in the first Gulf War that lasted only 42 days with a clear objective. Eject all Iraqi forces from Kuwait as rapidly as possible with as little loss of life. Winning hearts and minds and nation building, some of those kind of things becomes very, very difficult. Something he saw firsthand leading troops in the region a decade later. One of my airmen came up to me. I was a colonel at the time. Colonel, well, when are we gonna win the war on terror? And that was 10 years ago. This past year stretched our military well beyond combat and peacekeeping missions. I was the commanding general of the largest mobilization of the National Guard since 1942. McGuire had his 8,300 guardsmen deployed on five major assignments, from continued overseas missions to COVID test site setups and Black Hawk flights running supplies to the reservation. He sent teams south to the border to help agents with a surge of immigrants and shipped hundreds to California for wildfire rescues. 
Nearly 1,500 others got called up to keep the peace as protesters clashed with police in civil unrest. All five of those things go on simultaneously. Regardless of where you're deployed, he knows being away from home takes a toll on the military family. It's an amazing sacrifice that the families make. Missed days and months, memories and milestones. In August of 1990, I deployed. My wife, Debbie, was uh, six months pregnant. I came home March 1st, 1991. We had a four-month-old daughter. Not to mention the stress of the unknowns. We are a professional group that trains to fight and win wars. Our tactical mission is to put warheads on warheads. We feel confident that we're the best at it. But if you're at home wondering about that, you get nervous. The families are owed a great debt of gratitude. McGuire says in these changing times, our military is our constant always at the ready, serving strangers unseen unconditionally. And even when taken for granted, the commitment is unwavering, dedicated to protect these United States of different backgrounds and opinions, so we have the freedom to challenge our neighbors to live a life greater than ourselves. You're part of the greatest team in the history of the world. Whatever the next assignment, the Military Assistance Mission is ready for the win, standing by to support those Arizona families. Michael really loved this country. He loved that flag. You know, he was very, very patriotic. MAM founder and Gold Star mom, Margie Bonds, is proud of her Marine. He loved this country and died fighting for it, killed by a suicide bomb in Haditha, May 7, 2005. She found out on Mother's Day. I knew when they came. And we regret to inform you. Yeah, it was, uh, it was, uh, I felt bad for the Marines because, like I said, I argued with them. Michael's passion became her mission. I needed to step up. I needed to do what he would have wanted me to do. Remembering his struggles in service, Mom, I don't have gas money to go for drill, or I don't have this, I don't have that. She found purpose helping his brothers and sisters. They've thought of, tried everything, pawned everything. I mean, it's it's insane to me the stories that I'll get where someone's pawned a bunch of stuff so that they could eat. That's just crazy to me. Ma'am supports the lowest ranks that qualify as working poor. We need to be there to make sure that those families are taken care of. MAM offers financial aid for rent and utilities, groceries, car repairs, back to school supplies, sports, extracurricular activities, tutors, even gap grants for veterans waiting on the GI Bill to go to school. When I look at them, I think they had no idea who I was, but yet they signed on a dotted line for my freedom and to protect me. That is priceless. Margie loves these families like her own, spoiling them with Christmas gifts, baby showers, and seats for soldiers, anything and everything to honor her son and make him proud. It means so much to me, and especially knowing I'm doing it because of my son. There's just no better way. I am uh, in the Air Force Reserves. Sarah Weaver is a weekend warrior. I do my um, military duty the one weekend a month, two weekends a year, um, and then I also work a full-time civilian job. A forensic scientist for the Phoenix Police Crime Lab, Sarah always wanted to serve in the military. I joined um, the Air Force in 2019 at the uh, good old age of 38, and it has been the best decision of my life. She works emergency management out at Luke Air Force Base, assessing chemical, biological, nuclear, and radiological threats. I take such pride and such um, great honor every time I put that uniform on. I, I love it. When her 22-year marriage ended with a rough divorce, Sarah became a single mom of two. With no extended family support locally, she felt she had nowhere to turn. I was left financially to take care of everything, and I didn't know what to do. I was only making so much money. Then she heard about MAM. All they wanted to do was help me. Military assistance mission covered her mortgage and kept checking in. They're phenomenal people. Helping Sarah with everything from new and donated furniture to supplies for back to school. It felt so nice that somebody was stepping in at a time that I really needed help easing some of that emotional and financial strain so Sarah can focus on success in her new beginnings. I'm actually working on a commissioning opportunity to become an officer. At the age of 40, you know, I'm essentially starting over again. <laughs> and it's for people to open their hearts out up like that is amazing.
We couldn't help families like Sarah's without donors like you. So every year we recognize outstanding patriots and philanthropists. It is my great honor on behalf of Military Assistance Mission to present this year's Spirit Award to USAA. And joining me for this virtual presentation is Patrick Fitzhugh. Congratulations, Patrick. Thank you, Nicole. When COVID hit, your team really stepped up and doubled down, giving MAM a grant for $50,000 over the five, past five years. I think it's been upwards of $100,000. Why MAM? MAM is one of those organizations that regionally here in Arizona just perfectly aligns to our mission. The need is greater than ever, and a lot of amazing people are stepping up. So I'd say if you haven't done it yet, my question would be, what's stopping you? Tell me about your annual team building tradition. I think you're talking about zero day PT. Each year we have hundreds of employees who uh, volunteer for this. They get on a dark bus, they get driven to a location, and they experience a little bit of what boot camp and a little bit of what day one or day zero as we call it in the military is like. We only do this in four or five hours, but the employees are always thankful to have experienced it. My father served in the Air Force. My brother is uh, prior Air Force as well, uh, grandparents on both sides. So we do have a long uh, military service tradition and myself Air Force as well. I know USAA already helps a lot of active military and veterans, but you also recruit and hire them. We know that they are the DNA of our organization and uh, their service heart and their service history is really critical for USAA to, to stay true to its roots and to stay focused on its mission, which is looking after and caring for the military family. Patrick, thank you and your team at USAA for everything you all do in our community. It's our pleasure. Every dollar makes a difference. Whether you're watching live now or later online, it's not too late. Scan that QR code or donate through the links on our website and news app. A special thanks again to our title sponsor, Learner and Row Gives Back, and presenting sponsors, Discover and Sanderson Ford. We owe them a duty of gratitude and to do what we can to help them. Valley attorney Kevin Rowe has been a board member with MAM for years. Learner and Rowe Gives Back is all about paying it forward in our community, a huge help for Arizona military families. The fact that their families here at home are, are struggling to obtain the basic necessities, the basic needs for life, that is, for me, is completely uh, unacceptable. You know, we just did the, the uh, backpack uh, uh, back to school drive. Whatever ma'am needs over the years, Sanderson Ford's David Kimmerley's delivered from a pandemic drive through for back to school supplies to auctioning off a custom Mustang for ma'am at Barrett Jackson, loads of Christmas gifts and seats for soldiers. It's important that people understand and know that we appreciate what they did and to that we're carrying on their legacy. It's absolutely a way of life for all of us. Morgan Stanley was the largest tenant in the World Trade Center at the time. Tracy Hedrick helped turn Discover's Phoenix Call Center into an emergency hotline for their parent company after 9-11. They wound up taking more than 60,000 calls from all over the world. Everybody wanted to pick up a headset and take phone calls. It was just a remarkable opportunity that left fingerprints on the heart of Discover which is why organizations like Military Assistance Mission really speaks to what's important to us. I think it's our civic duty, you know, to give back to the communities that we live and serve. If you have the ability to give what you can to help others in our community as well too. It's only gonna make us better and make us stronger. Remember, MAM helps the lowest ranking military members working hard to make ends meet. Your support qualifies for the Working Poor Tax Credit, 400 individual, 800 joint. A huge thank you to these patriotic partners who gave above that threshold. And last but not least, on behalf of my team at MAM and all of us here at Arizona's Family, Thank you for tuning in today. I hope you will click to give and share to help the cause.